Hey everyone, Michelle Fadling here with another episode of Food Experience Unplugged. Today we'll explore cancer and disease prevention through healthy habits and lifestyle changes. Here to help us do that is Ginny Dent Brandt, a speaker and author of the book, Unleash Your God-Given Healing, Eight Steps to Prevent and Survive Cancer. This podcast is available on multiple platforms, including YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and others. Please be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform to be informed as new episodes become available. If you enjoyed today's podcast or any of our episodes, please be sure to rate and review it on your favorite platform. Also check out our website at foodexperienceunplugged.com for some resources as you begin your health journey. Ginny Dent Brandt, welcome to Food Experience Unplugged. Thanks, it's great to be here. It is so great to have you here, Ginny, as a a cancer survivor and really a a proponent of healthy lifestyle changes to prevent or at least minimize the chances of cancer or other disease. It's very Um, powerful. I've learned that there are lots of things you can do to minimize your risk for cancer and many diseases, including COVID-19. Mm-hmm. Well, that's wonderful. Well, to start out with, uh, will, will you introduce yourself and tell us what brought you to this point in your life and in your career? Okay. I spent 32 years as a public school counselor. Some days I was a teacher. Some years I was a teacher. Some days I was an adjunct professor. But I spent my life in education, educating people. And so when the cancer diagnosis came my way, And that hospital chaplain said to me, Jenny, you're an author, you're a speaker, you're a communicator, you could help so many people. I looked at him and I said, I don't want to talk about cancer. I don't want to speak about cancer. I'll never talk about it. I'll never write a book about such a thing. Well, after I did the research and started to realize that if I had known what I know now, I might not have gotten cancer. And then I realized I could help people to get through the journey. And I can also help people to maybe not go there, not get cancer in the first place. And that's when I began that quest to discover what I could do to help my doctor beat my cancer, what I could do to make my prognosis better. Mm, I love that. I love that you're working with your doctor, helping your doctor to help you. And that is is very powerful. Because your doctor has no control over your lifestyle changes. They can suggest things. They could tell a smoker, you've got lung cancer. I'd stop smoking if I were you but they can't make you stop smoking. They can tell you, you need to get more exercise. You need to eat a healthier diet, but they can't make you do it. So I help people to get in shape and turn around their lifestyle because it's the one thing your doctor can't control. It's just totally up to you. Mm, Good point. And this way you're giving them the best terrain on which to work, you know? And I want to be perfectly honest. If you're diagnosed with cancer and you have to have chemo, as I did, and you go into that chemo and you have a negative attitude and you say, oh, this is probably going to kill me. I'm going to have all these side effects. I don't want to do this. Whoa, whoa, pitiful me. Guess what? That chemo is probably not going to work as well. If you mm-hmm. go in with an uplifting spirit and go, you know, this is medicine to help stop the cancer. And you do uplifting things for that eight hour chemo regimen like I had all day long. You're going to fare better. Your doctor can't control your attitude, your diet, your lifestyle. So you're doing what you can to help your doctor because I can't do what the doctor does. I can't bring out the pills and the chemo and all the different in the surgery. I can't do those things. They do their job. I do my job. Mm, Excellent point. Now you delved into a lot of the research in order to, to help your doctor help you. Now, will you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I actually attended three cancer conferences with medical personnel and some of them were from different parts of the world. I read about 50 books, most of them written by nutritionists or scientific researchers or medical doctors. I also have gone online and listened to thousands of hours of lectures by doctor and nutritionist. You can do this. You can go to lots of different things. And I just became a bookworm and I just had this insatiable appetite. I just had to figure out how I got in the situation and what I could do to prevent it from coming back. So... I just, you know, I was like a a fast moving train that you just couldn't stop. I was just hungry to learn because this impacted my life. Mm, Interesting. Now, what role do you see all of that research playing as you, you know, 
built your healthy habits, you, you worked with your doctor. How powerful is that, that research in helping you? Well, according to my doctors, it's very powerful. When I finished my chemotherapy and I had to have six months of the harsh chemicals and then another six to nine months of one infusion every three weeks after that. And my doctor said, you know, we rarely see this, but all these things that, that you implemented um, have made a difference. Your blood work, your red blood cells, white blood cells and platelets were all back within normal ranges six weeks after chemotherapy was over. And that's, and they never got too far out of whack except for the white blood cells. And they have something they can, they can do for that. And they said, you know, we just don't normally see this in patients. They're not, you know, during chemotherapy, in the middle of it, I was climbing mountains, I was snow skiing, I was doing things that patients don't normally do, only to find that all that exercise pumps the lymphatic system, and it was helping the chemo to target the cancer, then it helped the chemo and the dead cancer cells to move out of my body. So that lymphatic system is important in preventing cancer, and in getting through the journey, if you have to have chemotherapy and surgery and the treatments. And then two years after the chemotherapy was over, my doctors pointed out to me that all that exercise, exercise I did really paid off because now the Australian research, 30 to 40 entities came together in Australia to show that the best thing a cancer patient can do is exercise and keep moving during the day. Now, you don't do that if you're so sick. You can't move. But you do what you can when you can and I never got sick during the chemotherapy. And part of it was probably based on the fact that I was moving before, afterwards, and every day in between. Mm, excellent. So they were, it sounds like they were very supportive of your, your lifestyle changes. Yes. And you'll see now because of that research in Australia that more uh, oncologists are telling their cancer patients to move it, if at all possible. Again, some people can't and depend on where they did the surgery. You know, I moved after surgery, I moved after chemo. It depends on what your doctor advises you to do, but most doctors are now telling their patients, sleep well at night, move during the day as much as you can, hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Mm, excellent. So, so, okay, so you did those things. What, um, when you were first backing, backing up a little bit, when you were first diagnosed with the cancer, what did you immediately plunge into the research? What were your what were your thoughts and, and feelings and, and attitudes at, at that time about, about that situation? Well, to be perfectly honest, I was shocked. Some people said I shouldn't have been. My mother had died from breast cancer four months earlier. I was still grieving her loss when I was diagnosed. But mm -hmm. it was a shock because the doctor sat down with me and they said, these are the eight risk factors for the breast cancer you've got. And I didn't have one of them. So they ordered wow. extensive, I mean, extensive genetic testing, thinking it must be genetic connected to her mother. The genetic test showed nothing. So that's what caused me to research. I'm going, all right, I have no risk factors for this aggressive cancer that swept mm -hmm. into my life like a tornado. And it's not genetic. I have nothing I can pin this on. And I kept saying, there must be something I'm doing. Everything has a cause, you know? So I kept looking and kept looking. And the more I researched, I said, yeah. There are things I was doing I did not know could cause cancer, and I needed to change some things. So one by one, as I'm learning, I'm changing things, and only to find out later that, yeah, there are other risk factors for cancer that we don't often hear about, and they are in my book. And since I've written the book, now the American Cancer Society and BreastCancer.org are starting to mention some of the things that I'm talking about as possibilities. Mm, excellent. Now, speaking of which, your your book that came out uh, earlier this year, Unleash Your God-Given Healing, Eight Steps to Prevent and Survive Cancer. So you really you know, delve into to, uh, different aspects of cancer prevention. But taking a step back, why why this book? Why did you feel um, inspired to to write this book? Well, Michelle, the more I learned that attitude I had with the chaplain of, I don't want to write a book about this. I don't want to talk about this started to become, oh, I have to do this because I just don't want other people to get cancer. So that's what propelled me. I didn't need it for my own benefit. I'd already learned what I needed to learn, but I kept saying, I'm like most people. I missed things along the way. And most people, most Americans are doing the exact same things that I'm doing that contributed to my cancer. So it was like a wake-up call for me to wake other people up. 
Mm, excellent. I'm glad that you're 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 paying it forward, so to speak, and and helping others to benefit from the the research that you've done. I hope and pray so, because I would love to see cancer rates start to go down. In 1930, people getting cancer were one in 30. Today, for the generation born today, it's one in two. Now, if that's wow. not enough to wake you up and realize that we're not doing something right, then, you know, it's, it's, something, it's something to think about. And, you know, since I've implemented the eight steps in my book and it helped me get through the cancer journey and come out with a better prognosis, not major side effects, I didn't come out of chemo with a suppressed immune system, which most people do. And it's because of the things I was doing. It's made such a difference in my life since the chemo, harsh chemo has been over for five years now. Usually you can have a suppressed immune system for up to two to five years. I've not. Since the chemotherapy, I've not caught one cold. Usually I catch two to three colds a year. But now I understand how the immune system works, how I can use food and exercise and all these lifestyle changes to ramp up my immune system. And I'm just not catching things right and left. Mm. That's excellent. I mean, from, from a general health perspective, number one, and also uh, recovering from cancer and moving forward with your life. That is super, super important. I'm so glad that you really got, got a grip on that in terms of, of knowing different steps to do. It certainly made a difference in my life and the life of my family. You know, my uh, children are starting to change what they do. My husband, of course, has had to change with me. He's getting used to the more plant-based diet. I'm not saying you have to be a vegetarian, but I eat more plants than I've ever eaten in my entire life. It is the basis of my diet now. Nuts, seeds, fruits, vegetables, herbs, spices, they're all cancer preventing and immune enhancing. Mm. And those types of things were in addition to or separate from the, the, the risk factors that, that you did not have when you were first diagnosed with the cancer. Right. I didn't see my diet as a risk factor. That's not listed in the risk factors. Diet mm. should be. I was eating the standard American diet. I was eating healthier than most Americans because I had learned some things about food and diet, but I was still way off the mark. And one of the former vice presidents of the cancer center that I was treated at, Cancer Treatment Centers of America, Dr. Patrick Quillen, who is a well-known worldwide nutritionist. He said, the standard American diet is fertilizer for cancer. Mm -hmm. I had to realize what I was eating that was certainly not helping me to prevent cancer, and if anything, would be feeding the cancer. Mm, interesting. Just based on, on what foods you were eating at the time or the level of activity. foods, all the white food, the white flour, the white sugar, all these things can help to drive cancer. And the first thing that a lot of doctors are, that are in the know about nutrition are telling their cancer patients to do is stop eating the high carbs and the processed foods. And in my case, I realized uh, that I needed to stop eating foods that weren't organic as much as possible because my body was tested when we couldn't find a cause and found high levels of pesticide residue in my body. Mm, wow. That that's crazy. You know, what they yeah. prey on our on our foods. And you know, my mm. husband was tested after I was tested and he didn't have the high residue and he has more exposure than I do because I figured out his filtering systems. We have five filtering systems in our body. And you've got your liver, your lungs, you've got your kidneys, your colon, and your skin is your largest detox organ. I simply don't sweat as much as my husband, but I do now because I have an infrared sauna and I get in it several times a week to help sweat out those toxins that I don't normally sweat out because I just don't sweat easily. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. I love that. I love but just- I also eat whole foods and I eat foods that are low in pesticide residue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, how, how easy was it or what was your experience with it as you made that transition toward, toward a healthier diet, toward different lifestyle changes? Well, it was, it was hard at first. It was like one change at a time. I would learn something and then I would implement it. And now it's just a normal thing. I completely, in my book, has a whole a part of a chapter where I show a pantry swap out. I went into my pantry and threw all the processed food out and changed out everything to clean and organic and naturally sourced. And it certainly made a big difference. But, you know, I grew up eating nuts, I mean, not nuts, grains and breads and cereals as the basic part of our diet, because that's what the food pyramid said. And now the food pyramid has changed to my plate where half 
of your serving should be from fruits and vegetables. So the main part of the pyramid now is fruits and vegetables. And a lot of those should be low, low carb. You don't want all the high carb things all day long, of course. But the point is, you know, I had an inverted food pyramid. Now it's the fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds, all these plants are at the bottom. And that's the basis of my diet and my protein. This is what's interesting. I've always loved meat, but my protein now comes from different sources. Oh, I'll use fish and salmon and grass-fed beef and organic chicken, but I don't do it three, three times a day anymore. I'll have nuts and seeds and different things that quinoa, you know, you learn to vary your sources of protein because the plant-based proteins are easier to digest. And mm-hmm. that gives your body energy to heal and, you know, help heal itself and promote healing in the body because all of your energy doesn't have to go towards digestion. Mm, interesting. I love that. And you learned all of these things through your research of different lectures or books or other things that you've that you've looked books at. Books and lectures and attending cancer conferences. Mm, okay. And that, that networking especially would be helpful in terms of not only networking with doctors, but others who are in your uh, specific circumstance as well. Yeah. And one of the one of the habits I developed was drinking a smoothie every day that has two cups of spinach or kale, cruciferous vegetables, because they're highly, you know, cancer preventative, especially for breast cancer and estrogen fed cancers. So I have a smoothie that has the greens and the sprouts. It has dark chocolate in it. It's not high on the glucose, you know, monitor, thank thank goodness. (laughs) And it has flax seeds and all these things in it. And a I get a cup of blueberries every day because blueberries helps your heart, helps prevent cancer, build your immune system, protects your brain from dementia. My father died of that. And so in this smoothie every day, my husband and I are getting like five or six superfoods and it's cancer preventative, heart problem preventative. It hits everything. And so that habit started then and now it's up. I probably get 10 to 13 fruits and vegetables a day where the average American gets two to three and they think French fries is a healthy vegetable. <laughs> think again. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Oh, my goodness. Now, what other, you've done a lot in terms of your diet, and you also talked a lot about, about exercise. Are, what other um, lifestyle adjustments did you make? Or was there anything else in the mix? Well, hydration is important because proper hydration impacts every cell and every system in your body, including your immune system. So I get up in the morning and have a habit of drinking two eight ounce glasses of clean water in the morning. And then I make sure I get half my body weight in fluid ounces at a minimum, at least throughout the rest of the day. If I need more because I feel cold coming on, which I haven't. But if I'm sweating or if it's hot or I'm going to higher altitude, of course, I increase that. But that proper hydration keeps your immune system functioning as God intended. And so that's just a daily habit that we all need every single day. Most Americans are dehydrated based on what they drink. Instead of drinking water or a smoothie, these fruit and vegetable smoothies you know, count as water. They're drinking soda pop and caffeinated drinks all day long, and that dehydrates. Mm. So you have to get the proper perspective on hydration. I have to do things to lower my toxic load because, again, when they tested my body and found parabens and phylates and pesticide residue, all kinds of things at high levels. It's one thing to have the low levels. Most people have at least low, low levels. You can't live in this world without the exposure to toxins. But I had to lower that toxic load because it distracts your immune system for, from working properly. Mm. Okay. And just that, that diet and the hydration were those uh, that you think were, were lowering those levels of the toxins? Yes. If you, well, if you exercise, if you hydrate, and then if you stop, you know, exposing yourself to as many chemicals, and I go into details on how to do that, and then using the sauna and these kind of things, your toxic load is going to be lower. And then you've got the fact that you've got to feed your gut properly because 70% of your immune system is located in your gut. And most people's guts um, are not healthy. There's a certain gut lining that you want, and it's prebiotic fiber that feeds the probiotics. And when something lands in that gut, like a COVID germ, your gut lining many times can take care of it before it activates in in your body. 
Mm-hmm. So it's important to have a healthy gut if you want a strong immune system. Our immune systems were were built and created to attack flus, viruses, and this COVID is more contagious. But there are things you can do to make your risk factors less that it'll activate in a negative way or that you'll get it to begin with. It's been, what, nine months since it started? And I have flown on airplanes. I have been down to Florida for TV interviews. I've been to Atlanta. I've been to Maryland for the birth of my grandchild. I have done so properly and with social distancing and following CDC guidelines, but I've also boosted my immune system. So if you lessen your exposure by following the CDC guidelines, and then you ramp up your immune system by hydrating, exercising instead of being that couch potato, eating potato chips, eating healthy foods, feeding that gut properly. If you do these kind of things, then you're going to lessen your risk for COVID-19. As well as other diseases, such as cancer. Actually, the eight steps in my book are related to cancer in the book, but I say at the end, well, guess what? These same eight steps would help prevent heart disease, dementia, flus, viruses, just almost every disease in the book, including autoimmune diseases, because the gut needs to be fixed first for all of these. You want to develop that healthy gut. And chemotherapy destroys the gut. Antibiotics destroys the gut. I was protecting my gut with foods and certain things that my uh, nutritionist and naturopathic doctor were telling me to do during chemotherapy. And then afterwards, I completely rebuilt my gut by eating pre all these plants and eating two to three probiotic foods a day. I continue to do that today. It's just a healthy way. I use apple cider vinegar as a probiotic every day and a tonic. I use coconut yogurt in my smoothie and I will use fermented vegetables. I'll hide them in the smoothie too, because I don't particularly like sprouts and fermented vegetables, but I can sure hide them in a chocolate banana smoothie. <laughs> Absolutely. And with a smoothie, you get so much nutrition in, in one glass of smoothie. And it's super, and it's convenient too. Not You're get, getting to eat more. You're being able to take it on the run if you need to or anything else. Are, are you finding that, that smoothies are, or other meals are, are pretty convenient? Yes, because it's a meal replacement. I didn't have to cook lunch, you know? <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's easy. A lot of people say, well, how do you do all this organic this and all this? And I said, well, a smoothie is easy and I'll freeze dinners. I'll make everything from scratch and then I'll freeze it and then we'll pull it out later. So, you know, it's not like I'm in the kitchen cooking all day. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you have some smoothies during the day, but you also have some some other additional meals. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, but I use my food as medicine. And that's one of the chapters in my book. Using food as medicine. You know, Hippocrates talked about that. I never thought about that until I got cancer. I ate based on what I liked. And then I added fruits and vegetables in there just to be healthy. That's just not enough. You know, I look now at everything I eat and I want to get high nutrient value and lower calories rather than just a bunch of empty calories. Mm. It's a whole different approach. And I like the foods that I that I eat. Sure. I'd like to have that hot fudge sundae and that cheesecake. And if my husband gets one or someone, I might take a bite. But that's just, (laughs) you know, not something I can do. And that bite sure tastes good. But. That's it. Once the bite is over, it's over for me. You know, it's not that you can't cheat every once in a while, but, you know, cheating can't be a normal everyday thing. Um, Mm. I look at everything for what is this going to do for my body? What kind of bang am I going to get for what I'm spending on this food? And I'm now willing to spend more for foods that are healthier. Mm. Excellent. Now, for those with, with budget challenges. What, what advice would you have as far as, as integrating the, these healthy, healthy habits, healthy lifestyles into that and navigating that even on a lower budget? Right. Well, a lot of the strategies in my book don't cost anything. Rest is one of them. And what that does for you and detoxing and regenerating your body when you sleep and ramping up your immune system, that doesn't cost. Hydration doesn't cost. Uh, exercise doesn't cost you anything to exercise. You can get fancy and go to a gym, but you don't have to. You can walk in your neighborhood and get your weights at home and do weight bearing exercises. So a lot of the things in the book don't have a cost. And I have the book divided into three, um, three different sets of suggestions at the end in summary. And the first is for those on a budget, because you can eat fruits and vegetables 
And you can eat a healthier diet just by what you choose. And it may not be that more, that much more expensive. But I do think people need to look at food as medicine. It is true. If you eat healthy, your budget will go up. But then again, you start cutting out the junk and the convenience foods. In that case, you might be spending the same amount if you did more at home. And eight simple things for snacks is nuts. You don't have to prepare nuts. Just grab them out of the bag, you know, and raw is usually best for most nuts. I love raw, raw cashews and pecans and, you know, I love them roasted, but I know they have more value if I just eat them raw. So it's a matter of choice. Are you going to choose the hot fudge sundae? Are you going to choose the, um, you know, fruit dessert, you know, Mm. which are you going to do? A lot of it is by choice. Mm, I love that. I love your referral to food as medicine and helping that to help your doctor to help you, essentially, going back to that. And you can also look, and I listed in the book, the dirty dozen are the fruits and vegetables by the USDA that have the most pesticide residue. And then the 15, clean 15, are the ones that, for some reason, they just don't have a high pesticide residue. So you can eat avocados and cantaloupes and watermelons without having to worry about whether they're organic. So I call that eating organic reasonably. If something doesn't have a high pesticide residue, I'm not going to worry about getting it organic. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Just getting getting the food, making those food choices that will bring the most value to, to your body and to your health. That's right. So anyone on a budget can read my book and they can improve their lifestyle drastically without improving, without making their budget go up too much. Now, when you're in the cancer journey, you're in a different situation. You've got to pull out everything and it is going to cost more when you're in the cancer journey. OK. Mm-hmm. And for those people that are high risk like me because they've had a cancer with chemo of it coming back, then I, I'm going to have to do more than the person who's just trying to prevent. Mm. So no. it's three categories at the end of each one of the sections, giving you suggestions based on. Are you on a budget and preventing? Do this. If you're in the cancer journey, do this. If you're trying to prevent the cancer from coming back and you want to go all out, add this, this, and this. Okay. All right. So it's a matter of not only quantity, but just quality, just doing a little bit different steps with each of those circumstances? Yes. Yes. So someone on a budget, I had you in mind when I wrote the book, because I know there are a lot of mothers out there trying to make their uh, foods and their lifestyle healthy, but they are on a budget. They may choose to stay home with their children in the early years, and then they see all these things they could do that cost money. And so I tried to make it geared to them so that they could get benefit from it as well. Mm, Absolutely. I love how you address those, those range of circumstances or everything in between, so to speak. Most people are on a budget, so (laughs) something to think about, yes. Yes, absolutely. Now, what advice would you have for those just starting out to really help them, whether they're trying to prevent cancer, whether they're involved in cancer treatment right now, or they're, um, you know, they they just want to live a, a healthier lifestyle? The first thing I would say is filter your water. Because it's inexpensive to get a water filtration system. Some can sit on your counter and cost $300, um, and that would last you for several years. It's important that the chlorine and the fluoride be taken back out of your water. If you have problems with your teeth, use a fluoride in your toothpaste. Your whole body doesn't need these two chemicals that can interfere with your thyroid production. And because high chemical content was found in my body, again, it can distract your immune system. I would say to that, even that young family on a budget, you know, filter your water for $300 that might last you 10 years, putting one of those on your counter and all the water you drink, you're taking those chemicals back out. So it's as clean as possible. Again, taking a family walk every day to exercise and pump that lymphatic system, get those toxins out of your body and to enhance uh, the function of every system in your body, both water and exercise enhance every system in your body. And having a proper bedtime where you and your family get deep sleep in that deep sleep is when melatonin, a hormone goes off, major cancer preventer. And also it's an immune boost and your body repairs and detoxes while we sleep. So we don't need to be living this hectic American life where sleep is, well, I'll get to it if I can. You know, it's a major, we need to sleep a third of the day and it's a major part of protecting our body from cancer and many diseases. And then 
you know, eat a healthier diet where you just simply eat more plants. If you can't afford all the organic food, simply eat more plants. Look at less portions of some of these heavy meat items and get more quality meat, the more grass-fed meat. And look at growing some of your own. I grow my own herbs. I grow a few vegetables. I'm not a great gardener, but you can grow certain things right there in your home pretty easily. And so having an herb garden and those things to just You know, soups and salads, you know, I'm putting herbs like crazy. I'm cutting up onions and garlic in my soup. If it says half a cup, I'm putting a cup of onions, you know, because they build the immune system and they're they're cancer preventing. And I would tell a family to, you know, grow a blueberry bush because those blueberries are so valuable in cancer prevention and building your immune system. They're just good for so many things that. There's easy, simple steps that any family can take, and you just take it one step at a time. You can't do it all at once. I had to do a lot quickly. I was fighting for my life. That's a different situation. So you just, as you find out, you you implement here, and then you implement there. And I do have a cancer prevention blog where I give suggestions, and I'm always keeping in mind those on a budget and those that are trying to make changes. And everybody can't make, everybody doesn't need to make all the changes I did. Let me put it that way. I don't even hold my husband to the same standard. Because his filtering systems work better than mine, you know, Mm -hmm. and he doesn't have some of the issues that I have. So if he eats uh, a dessert, let me go out and eat with with friends tonight. You know, that's fine. His body can handle that every once in a while. Mine just can't handle it as well. So I don't hold everyone to the same standard that I live by. I do what my body requires. Mm, Excellent. Now, with all the research that you did, how accessible do you feel that information is to, to, you know, to pretty much anyone? Well, a lot of it's in the book, a lot with all the footnotes. I have over 300 footnotes to medical journals in the book. And then when I write on the cancer and health prevention blog, I will actually put where I got that from as a hyperlink. So you can go right to it. And so the research is done for you. I mean, putting it all together. And then if you want to look further, you can just go right to that link and see the research for yourself. Mm -hmm. So the research, let me tell you, it's out there. Cruciferous vegetables, blueberries prevent cancer. The research is overwhelming. Most people don't know these things. And that's why I've taken on this quest so that people can implement healthier ideas and hopefully prevent cancer and other diseases. That is amazing. I love that your your dedication to not only your own health, but to sharing that information and helping others to, to do the same. I'd love to see a healthier America. We have more chronic diseases, as my research shows. And it's just, you know, our body was made this built-in capacity to heal. But we have to do the right things for our body to work as it was created. And that's just what I totally missed (laughs) in so many years. And I realized, you know, a lot of Americans are missing that. We're eating for pleasure and not as medicine and not considering our health and the benefits to our health. And even doctors will tell you, if you really ask them, we're causing a lot of our own demises and diseases. No doubt about it. I mean, cancer is mainly lifestyle caused uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, I found out from the, those conventions I went to, very heavily lifestyle influenced. There mm-hmm. are things we can do to prevent. And if you do all these things and you still have something come up, then at least you can say it's not my fault. You know, <laughs> you've done what you, what you could. Mm-hmm. So it's just better to have a plan of prevention than to get bit like I did, where your whole life is turned upside down, trying to fight for your life. And I'd just rather people you know, not have to go there. And I think families are going to have to look at, you know, you try to protect your children from many things, outside influences and, you know, teach them good, you know, habits and things, but they're going to have to look at how can we prevent disease? Because too many people are getting too many diseases. And right now kids are going to school in some parts of the country and you want to up their chances that they're they're not going to get COVID-19, you know, Mm -hmm. and, or if they do get it, that it's not going to activate in one of these, um, really, really bad, bad ways where they can't breathe and end up in the hospital. And most children don't have to do that. But the point is, in the world we live in, here we are in the middle of a pandemic, more reason to not be the couch potato who's eating, um, drinking Coke, eating potato chips. And by the way, potato chip sales are up during this pandemic. So, (laughs) you know, it's just amazing. 
the things that common sense things that we're not trained to do and we're not thinking about that we need to think about. And that's then that's what I'm here for to make people think, especially those people that are looking for answers. Mm, excellent. I love that. I love your wealth of information and how accessible it is. Not only the research that you've done, but, but research about foods in general. That is fantastic. Foods well, are powerful. I mean, the best ally I had besides a naturopathic doctor in my cancer journey was a nutritionist that my cancer hospital provided for me. And I still see her occasionally. And these nutritionists know things that, you know, they didn't used to know 20, 30, 40 years ago. So it is a very exciting field today. Absolutely. Well, Jenny, how can people get in contact with you? They can go to my um, website at www.jenny, G as in girl, I, N N Y Brant B as in boy R A N T dot com. I have a cancer prevention blog. I've got all kinds of information on that website, as well as information about my book, Unleash Your God Given Healing. Oh, fantastic. We will include all of those in the show notes. And Ginny, it has been an absolute pleasure. You are a wealth of information, and I'm so grateful for your willingness to share not only your story, but those things that you can do as for food as medicine and to be able to help prevent a myriad of different different diseases or other things by simple lifestyle changes. Amen. I'm all about lifestyle changes and thanks, Michelle, for having me. 